that's sad or, or fearful or any of those kind of emotions, you are actually in God's... If we compare it to the, what you will be in your pure state, you are in error. So whenever I'm sad about something that I'm experiencing, I am in error. But the only way to let go of the error is to experience the emotion. So you've actually got to stay in the emotional experience. What happens a lot of times I find intellectually with people is that they often try to say, oh, well, AJ, you don't need to feel that emotion. Or, or they try and say to themselves, well, um, we don't need to have that emotion uh, because that emotion's in error. And that's where a lot of people have a lot of trouble with progression on the divine love path. Because the truth is, you have to actually experience the emotions that are in error for them to leave you. So that means if I've got some grief inside of myself, I need to experience the grief in order for that grief to leave me. The other thing I wanted to clarify too is that, remember I talked a lot about the relationship with parents and children yesterday and how a parent would be feeling with regard to the free will of the child and how they'd be feeling with regard to their own free will. Again, bear in mind that if I'm doing anything for someone else and it feels like a burden or a chore, then most of the time, I have an em well, all of the time, I have an emotional error within me that needs to be released. So I'm not saying that in the future you might not continue to do that particular thing for your child, but you will actually do it from a condition of love. As soon as you feel any resistance of any type, an, an emotion of, or sadness or an emotion of anger or resentment or even smaller emotions of annoyance and those kind of emotions, they are all emotions that are erroneous, but you have to experience them and get to the underlying core of them before they'll be released. So it's the same kind of principle of what I was talking about with myself. When you get into a state where you judge the other person's experiencing that, or you're judging yourself from experiencing that, then you shut down your whole release process. And that's what happens to the majority of us at times. We have this tendency to judge it and we go all intellectual on the emotion. And as soon as we do that, we're really getting away from the full experience of the emotion. So if you could always picture, and I keep reminding you of this, always picture a child in this state. What would they be doing? And allow yourself to do the same thing. That's what I do for myself. So generally, if a child is angry, the child would be cracking a tantrum, right? So I allow myself to go out on a punching bag and just crack a tantrum, right, on the punching bag. And then, and then, then within a few, if I allow that completely, within a few seconds or a minute maybe at the most, generally I'm in the underlying causal emotion. If you shut down the whole process by using your intellect saying, oh, but this is just an emotion. If I think differently, I will feel differently. You will never release the emotion. So what happens a lot of times with people on spiritual paths is they go down the track of thinking differently because they know what they're thinking is true. Or they know what they're thinking is the way they should be thinking, if we can put it that way. Example, I should be thinking that I have worth. But I've just attracted an event where somebody treated me unworthily. So what do I do? Well, if I go with my thoughts, I'll probably go back and say to them, you've treated me unworthily, da, 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 and away you go, and start saying all of these things to them. But you're actually just avoiding the underlying causal emotion inside of yourself. Does that make sense? And the underlying causal emotion inside of yourself is unworthiness that attracted this thing. And if, really, if you want to deal with the emotion and release it, you need to be like a child. What would a child do in that situation? They would feel their unworthiness. Unless, of course, the child's been shut down, then they won't. But normally the child will just feel this terrible feeling of unworthiness. When you feel that childhood feeling, which is obviously locked up inside of you, it will release and you won't attract the event. And this is why using your intellect to do emotional work is really, really pointless in a way. Because what it does most of the time is get you completely away from the experience of the emotion itself. Does that make sense to everyone? Now that doesn't mean that at times you may need to use your intellect as a tool to help you feel your emotions. 
So in other words, when I'm in a state of, say, anger, I need to use my intellect to say, I'm denying my emotion. Anger means I'm denying a causal emotion. I need to find out why. What blockage do I have? That's when you can use your intellect as a tool far better. But if you're actually feeling the emotion, what I'm finding still in these groups sometimes, when I'm feeling emotion, I get a projection from the audience or even some in the audience saying to me, oh, but you don't need to feel that this because we actually feel this way, you know, or we feel that way. But that just tries to stop me from feeling the emotion. Does that make sense? And that's shutting me down. And if I do that with you, I'll be shutting you down. So the key is to allow the person experience the emotion completely. After they've experienced the emotion completely, tell them the truth. But don't do it before they finish their experience of their emotion. The reason why we need to do that is your emotions, we were discussing this last night with Paula and James a little, your emotions that block you from feeling the truth are the error emotions. So you could think of yourself in your soul, remember you've got the error emotions and the truth emotions. Now there's a basic law of the universe and that is that truth and error cannot exist in the same thing at the same time. So have you ever heard that one before? Truth and error cannot exist in the same thing at the same time. And this is where we get into trouble as humans generally. We think we're thinking the truth but often we have a feeling of error that's totally in opposition to the truth we're thinking. Right? And our soul is the thing we're trying to develop, not our mind. So what we, try, what we need to do is get to the point where we're honest with what's in our soul. So let's say my soul has a hopeless feeling. The world's a hopeless place. That's what's in my soul. This feeling of terrible hopelessness about the entire world. Now, I can think all, of, all I like positive thoughts about being hopeful about the future and I can listen to somebody who has a really hopeful view of the future, all I like, but in the end, it's, that thought is going to enter me or, that, or the words are going to enter me, they're going to start to descend into my soul and then there's this opposition emotion in my soul saying, no, 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 the world is a hopeless place. And can you see how this truth can't enter you as a feeling? It can only enter your thoughts when I'm like that. Now the only way for the truth, that truth that the world is a hopeful place, can enter my feelings is for me to actually go into the depths of the despair of the hopelessness and feel that emotion out of me and let it flow out of me and now my soul is open to the truth that the world is a hopeful place. Does that make sense to everyone? That's the, what we're trying to describe here. You have emotions inside of ourselves, we have those emotions inside of ourselves that prevent us from emotionally accepting the truth. Now the problem that most of us face is that we think we've intellectually accepted the truth. But most of the time, many of the things we think we know to be true, we don't actually feel to be true. For example, many of us feel, or I should say many of us think that there is a spirit world and that I live eternally so therefore I don't have to worry about death. So the majority of those coming along to these sessions now would think that thought. But what happens when your child is faced with death? How do you feel now about it? Now most parents under those circumstances would go into a big panic. Agreed? So have, has the thought of not worrying about death really entered my soul yet, if that's the case? The answer is no. Why? Because there's emotions inside of myself that prevents that true thought from entering into me emotionally and becoming a, an emotional belief inside of myself. Does that make sense to everyone? And what I would like to do is encourage you to stop thinking you know the truth and to start allowing yourself to feel what your true feelings are doing inside of you about the truth. And that's a very different process, but that is the soul process that we're talking about. Remember, it's your soul that transforms into at one moment with God, not your intellect. So this all has to happen at a different layer than what we're used to living in. And the layer we're used to living in, in generally is here in our mind, 
And what we need to do is get down into our true feelings, not what we think those feelings are, but what the law of attraction is actually showing to us that they are. That's what we need to start seeing inside of ourselves. And then once we see those emotions, we start allowing them to bubble up and then we allow them to flow out of us. Now, the error emotion has left me and so the true emotion, the one that I knew was true here all the way along, but still hasn't entered me emotionally, can enter me. So the problem for most people today is that they have this very strong intellect that they believe they know the truth when they hear it. And many people say to me, oh, I knew that, I knew that, I knew that. And I'm saying, I'm sorry. No, you just think you know that. Because as yet, it hasn't entered you emotionally. And you will not know it inside of yourself until it becomes an emotional truth inside of you that changes your life then you will know it. So I hope that's clear in terms of what we were trying to do yesterday. Mary has a few things she'd like to say to well, I was just going to add about um, the, you were giving the example of the hopelessness and thinking that we're hopeful. For me, it even went as far as my career. I based my whole career around avoiding this feeling of horrible hopelessness that I have about the world. Yeah. So I was taking a lot of external actions to try and better the world and feel like there was hope and seek a lot of seeking people I think have this emotion, mm -hmm. um, seeking truth and seeking hope when really I just needed to feel how hopeless I felt about everything. And then you went to a location that drew you to it because of the hopeful feelings you had and what happened? Uh, my feelings of hopelessness overwhelmed me. Yeah. <laughs> So Mary went to Lebanon working in a refugee camp and her own law of attraction was bringing her this more and more hopeless feelings. Does that make sense for her to experience? And then when she allows herself to feel all of those hopeless feelings, then, then she will truly feel hopeful inside of herself. Right, so that process is probably still in the Not still finished in process, yet. Isn't it? Yeah. Does that make sense to everyone how that works? So a lot of times our job, our life, our, our, all of our human interactions many times are there trying to satisfy our emotional addictions that we have but we think that everything's happening on a different level altogether. And this is where we need to get back into full truthfulness with ourselves. Carol, you had a question? No, this already might be. AJ, a lot of us are trying to change our situation in our lives, so this is possibly a question a lot of people might want to ask, and I'm really confused at the moment as to whether, like I used to go along um, creating things around me, like my property and that, by just seeing it there and being in it and living in it, and then I read Eckhart Tolle's, you know, stay in the now thing, and I'm thinking, oh no, don't be there, be where you are now. And now I'm reading the Judas thing that says, yes, dream, you know. Yes, dream. <laughs> but, the, the, but the thing is, I'm, I'm, I'm running my property, but living in another property that I want to build soon, and I walk out of my house and I feel like I'm stepping out of that place, and I'm still where I am. And I, am, I, am I just avoiding, or am I... You know, like this new reality I've is very real. I've already answered these questions for you, Karen. <laughs> I told you what you really desire and you don't believe me. Oh, I've changed and, a bit since then. Yeah, but what you really desire is what you have right now. And you see, this is... Can I do, just talk about two aspects of this? There's the aspect of the law of desire. So desire is the first thing. Desire, you can think of desire as passion. Desire also creates things like faith. And desire creates things like imagination. All of those things are all real tangible things that are then used to create reality. So you look at things on earth, for example. When you imagine something and it really appeals to your heart, then you start sort of going down the track of creating it in many cases, don't you? Many people do this in an artistic way. So they imagine a drawing they would like to draw and they draw it and it becomes real. And many people do that in a scientific way or an engineering way. They imagine a bridge across a certain place with a certain design. This is what architects do every day, isn't it? They imagine a building of a certain type of a certain nature and they draw it and then all of a sudden it gets built. So all of these things come from imagination and desire. So these are very, very powerful things. You need to follow your desires and your passions and your imagination. But then there's also the underlying, if you like, 
emotions of error that our father is constantly trying to trigger within us using different laws. The different laws are that we've gone through law of cause and effect, the law of attraction, the law of compensation. All of these laws are there to help us deal with this group of emotions that prevent us from a connection with God. So, desire is very powerful. Desire always creates. Even if it's a negative desire, it always creates something, uh, which includes damage to our own soul. So if I had a desire to go and rape a woman, that is going to have a negative result, for example, on a lot of different things, both to myself and my own soul, but also to the woman and and to her family and to her relationships and everything. It's going to affect everything. So those kind of desires come from emotions that are what I would classify as error emotions or emotions that are not based on truth. What happens is our law of attraction is telling us that what we think we want is not what we really want if we're not getting what we really think we want. Now that was pretty... (laughs) I don't know if I could repeat that one. So, let's say I think I want a new car. That's what I think I want. But my soul says you're not worthy for a new car. You're only worthy for a car that's worth $1,000. That's all you're worthy for. So what's going to come into my field? What's going to come into my attraction? I'm going to attract a car that my soul is saying I'm worthy for. But my mind's saying, no, no, I want the new car, I want the new car, I want the new car. So then I go and find a job that pays me more money. And look at that, what happens then? Oh, boy, the job is really hard to do and a lot of people hammer me. And I'm trying to actually create this new car and then I decide, oh, well, the best way to get a new car, I've got the job now, the best way to get a new car is go and borrow all the money for it. So I go and borrow all the money for it, and then I put myself in this debt that I can't pay, and, I, and I'm, create, I'm trying to work around my law of attraction. Does that make sense? The whole time. The simplest thing to do would just be sit down and feel that I'm only worth the $2,000 car. And, uh, and let the emotions come up inside of me that allows me to see that, 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 that that I'm actually feeling about myself. Does that make sense to everyone? But I only want the $2,000 car. No, no, you only think... I want to go back to that. You only think you want that, Carol. (laughs) This is what I've been saying to you the whole time. You think you want to get rid of your property. But I don't want to cook for anybody anymore. I can't even make myself make a meal. It's very bad for business. But I've told you how to deal with that. (laughs) (laughs) But you just don't want to believe me. That's okay. You don't have to. But the truth is... You, 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 I, I do agree you don't want to cook for everyone. I do agree with that. But then you worry. See, there's an emotion that kicks in. Of, oh, okay, like, if I don't do that, then I won't have money coming in to pay for the debt that's on my property, right? And so really a lot of times what, what's been driving you is the fear about the debt that's on your property. And that whole situation is there for you to deal with the fear about the debt which you're not wanting to deal with, what you want to do is just get rid of the debt and then you don't have to deal with the fear. Does that make sense? You're better off, far better off, to deal with the fear about it first. Deal with the fear about it. What's it triggering inside of you? It's triggering this panic feeling and other types of emotions of being under somebody else's control. In this case, the bank's control, if you like, in a way. Being under some, and being beholding to other people because there's a few people involved in the debt, isn't there? So, so you're being beholding to other people in a way that they are now controlling you in a way and you're feeling controlled by the whole situation. So your law of attraction has brought you this feeling of being controlled. So go into it. Let yourself feel it completely. When you feel it completely, your law of attraction will change. Then you'll either get out of the debt if that's your pure desire or something will happen to bring you funds where you get out of the debt naturally. But if you don't deal with the underlying emotions that are being created by the event, what happens is you'll be trying to do it all intellectually and getting yourself more into a panic and more into a worry and more into stress and so forth, which actually creates more fearful-based law of attraction events to get you into a state where you eventually get to the underlying causal emotion. So that's what's happening for the majority of people on the planet. For the majority of people on the planet, we're 
trying to do something that's totally the opposite of what our soul is sending out to the universe. And that's where we need to understand what's going on. If, you're, if you think you want something and it's not happening, then you don't want it in your soul for some reason. So try to find the reason. Pray about what would that reason be. Instead of just telling yourself, I've got to try harder. I've got to do more effort. I've got to do more marketing. I've got to do more selling. I've got to do whatever. Once you get into that mode, you are getting right out of this mode of dealing with the underlying causal emotion. Does that make sense? Really important to understand those principles. But desire is very powerful. And when your true desire is present without limitation, that's when you actually create in the most powerful way. Remember I've often used the example of I'm a, I'm a young man who's, who sees a wo who, woman that he like, who would like to get to know and he starts taking a walk towards her to get to know her but then these emotions start kicking in and the emotion, the first emotion might be oh, what if she rejects me? <coughs> now as soon as I feel that first emotion is my desire now pure? No, so straight away I'm now creating less than what I would have created if my desire was pure. Now I'm not suggesting for you to get out of your emotion of rejection. I'm suggesting dive right into your emotion of rejection, feel it completely in that particular instance and you'll find then you have no fear of rejection when you walk towards the woman if you're the man in this instance. Does that make sense to everyone? It's about dealing with things at the core, not, not here. But we are often fooling ourselves here. We are often saying to ourselves, I already know this. I've heard AJ say this like five times, ten times, fifteen times, twenty times before. I know it. And AJ's going, I'm sorry, but you don't know it yet because it's not here yet. It's not a feeling yet inside of you. Right? Look at why it's not a feeling yet inside of you. And there was always a blockage and the blockage is always the opposite. So the emotion of truth that the world is a hopeful place cannot enter me until the opposite emotion that I have within me leaves me. How does it leave me? By my experiencing that emotion to completion. Which might, with God's love, take a day or it might take a week. If you really get into the emotion and allow yourself to be overwhelmed by it. When you come out of that place, you'll now have feelings inside of you of hopefulness that you won't need to manufacture with your mind because your mind is totally unnecessary in terms of the entire process really because it's your soul that you're developing. So hopefully that makes sense in terms of a bit of background on yesterday. Today what we wanted to do is grab these principles of the natural love principles, the love for others on one hand and the laws governing the love of yourself on the other hand, what we want to do is pull them all together into some basic, concise questions that you can ask yourself about your relationships. Now, there's three groups of questions that we'll be asking. The first group of questions is what... Whoops. You see how my mind just doesn't follow my soul sometimes? I just... <laughs> I wrote love instead of what? Uh, what does love do? So what we're going to do today is one of the groups of questions we'll be asking ourselves in our relationships to work through these different issues with regard to our relationships is asking ourselves this question. What would love do in this situation? What does love do? The next group of questions we're going to ask is what does desire do? You see, so many of us believe that love and desire are almost separate from each other. You know, you hear it quite often, I really love my husband but, you know, we haven't had sex for the last five years. So where's the desire in this love? And then they say, oh, it's a different kind of love now. Yes, it certainly is. It's a love without desire. <laughs> and that needs to be addressed. There's something going on there. Because love will always have desire in it. 
Love is a deep, passionate longing. Is it part of love is this deep, passionate longing you will have? If it's love for God, it will be a deep, passionate longing for God. If it's love for your partner, it will be a deep, passionate longing for your partner. If it's love of your children, it will be a deep, passionate longing for your children. It will be expressed differently because the love of your partner obviously will have the sexual side of it involved in it. But there should be some longing in there. If there's longing in there, then you will always have desire. So we've got to ask the questions of what does desire do? And then the third group of questions is what does God's love do? Now what we're going to do is break this up into two sections. We're going to cover these things in today's discussion. So this will be session one of this. Of this. And then we're going to look at the divine love path and how that influences our relationships right down into the soulmate relationship as the second part of the session. So that'll be another day. Does that make sense? So what we want to do today is focus on what does love do and what does desire do in our relationships. And we want to come up with a group of questions that we can ask ourselves. And I just had a thought that I'm not recording, but I am recording. I don't know where that thought came from. And um, so we want to ask these questions, what does love do and what does desire do? And we want to come up with a group of basic questions that we can ask ourselves and our partner can ask themselves that will help us actually work through emotional issues in the partnership. Now, one thing I would like to make sure that you understand right at the start is this. If you do not desire your partner or your partner does not desire you, it doesn't mean that no love exists between you. What it may mean is that there is a group of emotions that exist that prevent your desire. Does that make sense to everyone? And even sometimes you will feel no love at all for your partner or they may feel no love at all for you in a particular instance. And yet, when they release a certain emotion, all this love and desire comes flooding back to them. So the problem with these two qualities, love and desire, is that they are heavily influenced by emotional injuries. And this is why it's so important to ask the questions. Because when we ask the questions, we can identify the injuries, and if we can identify the injuries, we know what emotions we can work on to release to work through our relationship issues. Does that make sense with everyone in terms of what sort of path we want to take? So what we don't want to get in the trap of doing is saying, oh, I've got no desire for my partner now, so I'm out the door. Well, your law of attraction brought this person in your door and you're now with them, so they're there for you to work through some of your emotional injuries, obviously. So you walking out the door without healing any of those emotional injuries, what's it going to do? You'll walk in straight into another door with a different face and a different body but the same injury situation and you'll create another relationship of a very similar type. That's what you'll do. What's the point in that? It's better the devil you know, <laughs> if we could call him that, the guy you're with, or the, the, the witch you know, if it's the girl you're with perhaps. Um, Better that than the person that you, that you don't know, that you're now attracting in and have to get used to all these different things. But in the, the bottom line is going to be the relationship would be identical if you do not heal what's within yourself. So what I'm suggesting is when we ask these questions, we're not asking the questions from the point of view of pointing the finger at the other person. And this is very important to understand. We're asking the questions so that we can point the finger at ourselves and get to the underlying emotions, the truth to, of the underlying emotions that we feel within ourselves, about ourselves and about our partner and about ourselves and our desire and about our partner and their desires. That's the point of doing this exercise. So hopefully there's no confusion about what's the point of doing these exercises. Does anyone have any questions so far? No? Okay, well let's proceed. Now, if quite a few um, years ago, um, some people wrote me a letter, which uh, some of you may have noticed I sent to you this morning. 
Um, there was a letter about human relationships that I wrote that I sent out in 2005, so four, over four and a half years ago, or four and a half, about four and a half years ago now. It's called, uh, I called it Relationships. So if you haven't got it in front of you, you probably will have it on your email when you get home. All right? Now what I would like to do is actually read you portions of this letter because, and then illustrate what I'm trying to say in the letter. Because there's a lot of very important points that I'd like to raise with regard to the first set of questions, what does love do? So what we're doing now is we're concentrating on the first set of questions, what does love do? So I said some have been struggling with their personal relationships and this has been causing them internal stress since there is nothing more consuming of our emotional energy and time than a relationship that does not seem to be working. And they've asked me for my advice to assist them. Now, just as an aside, I've personally found that there is nothing more consuming for me than a relationship that isn't working. Now, many of us detune from relationships that aren't working. And so what we do is we start being consumed by other things instead of the relationship not working. All that generally is is an avoidance of a relationship that's not working. My suggestion is if your relationship isn't working, it's one of the greatest sources of happiness if it is working, and it can be one of the greatest sources of pain if it isn't working. And to be honest, if your relationship isn't working, there are deep emotional injuries that that's pointing to within ourselves. And we have a great capacity to heal those emotional injuries if we look at it truthfully. And that's why whenever, I, like with my and Mary's relationship, it consumes us. Sometimes in a negative manner, in that we're, we're dealing with emotions between each other, other times in a really positive manner, in that we're consumed by each other. But in the end, if it's not doing that, usually we're avoiding just the emotional injuries underneath. So in each case I've written a personal message to the people who are asking these questions but since the relationships are a very important part of our life I thought it would be good to provide some answers in a more general format for all of you to read. And there is always danger in providing relationship advice when you've not seen the people in the relationship together. Isn't that the case? And so rather than saying things personally that I feel about your personal relationships which obviously you can do when you can feel the emotions of everyone around you. I want to just make some general comments, which is what this discussion today is about, making general comments that every single relationship can work their way through. So the first question that has to be asked in the relationship is, what does love do? Now, since we're often injured personally in love, the question needs to have be supplemented with other questions really because most of the time we don't even know what love is let alone what love does. So often our love injuries cause us to have a complete incomplete view of love and these injuries usually manifest themselves in either a poor viewpoint of love of self or selfishness when dealing with others. When we ask what would God's love do we are attempting to see our partner and ourselves as God sees us and that's why in our second discussion that we'll be having on the subject we'll be focusing on what does God's love do. If you ask that question you can often find errors in your own viewpoint of love which then can be healed. So we are attempting to see our partner and ourselves as God sees us and we come to understand that our feelings and our partner's feelings are of equal importance to God. Now since the relationship involves two people the question must what does love do applies equally to both persons. These things, by the way, that I'm going to present today will all sound very simple to you. <laughs> and, uh, but my suggestion is, rather than looking at the simplicity of them and thinking, oh, this is far too simple, um, you know, it's not going to work for me, my suggestion is to actually look at how everything to do with love is generally very simple. So allow yourself to just com conceptualise that this is a very simple process, really. So the two questions that must be asked for from two perspectives. So what does love do needs to be asked by both parties. Agreed? So what does my love do? And then I need to also ask the question, what would the other person's love do towards me? So that's two questions. And then my partner would need to ask the same two questions, wouldn't they? What, 
So the same two questions are, what would my love do for my partner? And then what would my partner's love do for me? And then I need to ask another set of questions. And that is, what does my, what does my own love for myself do for me? And my partner needs to ask that question. What does my love for myself do for me? So when you start adding up all the questions that you ask, what does love do about, there's really eight questions. Four for each partner. They're the same four questions for each partner. So let's list what they are. What would my love for myself motivate me to do for myself? So in the relationship, what would my love for myself motivate me to do for myself? Now let's put this in a practical situation. If I loved myself, would I care for my own environment? Yes or no? Yes. Okay. If I loved myself, would I be reliant on anybody else to feed me? No. Right? So, what would my love for myself motivate for me to do, my, do for myself? Well, if it comes to cooking, it would motivate me to cook for myself. Agreed? And if it comes to cleaning, it would motivate me to clean my own clothes. And if I went to business uh, work and I had a suit, it would motivate me to check under the armpits and just make sure everything's a bit, you know, smells okay. And so that, so because that's part of love of self, right? So my love of myself will motivate me to do a lot of things for myself. Now it's just wonderful if someone else wants to do those things for you. So I, I don't know about you, but I just love, you know, come out from working out the backyard or something like that. Come in and <sighs> somebody's already cooking for me in the other house. And I just go, wow, that's so good. I don't have to do that now, right? So somebody else's love for me is motivating them to do that for me and them. And that's a beautiful thing. That's just a gift. But if I walk in and there's no smell, I don't feel sad because my love for me would motivate me to do that for myself. Does that make sense? Right, next question. What would my love for my partner motivate me to do for them? So what does love do? What would my love for my partner motivate me to do for them? All right, so here's another situation. I know Mary's been crying all day about some kind of emotional issues. So I walk in after a hard day's work outside in the yard, come in, and no, no meal, right? So what do I do? Now, if I love my partner, I would understand what's been her situation, wouldn't I? And I, because I also love myself, would gladly cook for myself, so why wouldn't I just add a bit of extra vegetables, a bit of whatever, so that I'm cooking for two? Why wouldn't I do that? I would, wouldn't I? That would be my love for my partner would motivate me to do that. Okay, next question. What do I feel my partner's love for themselves would motivate them to do for themselves? I'll say that one again. What do I feel my partner's love for themselves would motivate them to do for themselves? Now, that's a very good question because, you know, a lot of times we're there thinking they should be doing something about things and we finish up doing it for them. Right? And then we get grumpy about it. Oh, I'm sick of doing that for them. Gee, that's, that's, I'm, I'm getting really tired of this. We shouldn't have even been doing it for them in the first place many times because their own love of themselves should have motivated them to do that for themselves. So for example, let's say this happens a lot, you know, the guy comes home, strips off, chucks it on the floor, puts on trackies, t-shirt or whatever, lounges down, cracks a tinny. Uh, tinny, for those overseas, uh, is obviously a beer or something like that. And uh, sits down in front of the telly, has a relax, says, I worked all day, where's my meal? And <laughs> right. The typical Aussie norm that you see on telly sometimes. Right. Now, would my partner's love for themselves motivate them to do something for me that I won't do for myself? That's a good question, isn't it? To ask ourselves. So what am I, what, and also, do I do things in order to take away my partner's love of themselves? 
So it's a very important thing to bear in mind. So I'm there in the relationship and I'm asking myself this question. How, what do I feel my partner's love for themselves would motivate them to do for themselves? And I start thinking, oh, my partner's, you know, been work, looking after the kids all day, they're now off to sleep, just off to sleep. And now I want her to do my ironing for tomorrow. Right? Now, if my partner really loved herself, she'd been working all day just as much as I have, right? So, so if she really loved herself, wouldn't she just stop and rest? if she felt like she needed a rest. And what I would try to do if I, if I loved her is I'd encourage her to love herself more. Does that make sense? I would actually encourage her to stop. And say, stop, stop, you don't need to do this. Like, I'll, you know, if it's my stuff, I need to do it anyway. That's part of my love of myself. So can you see a lot of times just asking these four basic questions can change a lot of things in a relationship. The fourth question, what do I feel my partner's love for me would motivate them to do for me? Now this is where we get really stuck a lot of the times because we often expect our partner to do a lot of things for us, particularly emotionally, that we're not doing for ourselves emotionally. So for example, we see this a lot happening in relationships, this particular thing. I have this feeling that I need attention inside of myself and it's emotion. So my partner comes home from work and he's been giving attention to a long list of people who needed attention <laughs> today. So he might have done, he might be consulting or might be a doctor or might be a lawyer or whatever he is doing and I'm using the traditional thing where it could be just as much, when I say traditional I mean you know the man off to work, the woman home looking after the kids type thing which obviously doesn't have to be the case, let's swap that over. The man might be home looking after the kids Right. And the woman, who's a lawyer, might have just spent the t time dealing with all of her needy clients today. Most of them in places of distress and most of them trying to really, really struggling with all these different em emotions that they're feeling and she just comes home and she's shattered, right? Exhausted from this whole emotional process. But I've looked after the kids all day. And I'm pretty exhausted from my emotional processes from that as well. You know, the law of attraction that the kids had today showed me every single emotion that I had that I'm not working on. And I feel totally, totally exhausted by the whole process. And I just want someone to look after the kids for me. So now we've got two people in an emotionally distraught place together. Now, if I'm not thinking about anyone other than myself, I will be very, very tempted to demand that the other person does some things for me in that situation. And can you see how an argument can quickly develop from that demand? You just need one of those two people making a demand and you've got probably a pretty fiery argument on your hands. Right. And then of course they deal with the emotions and by then it's 10 o'clock at night and they feel horny so they go and have sex or whatever and then go to sleep but nothing really gets dealt with in that whole process because everybody is still not asking the basic questions about love that they need to deal with inside themselves. That's why all of those events happen. So those four questions again. What would my love for myself motivate me to do for myself? What would my love for my partner motivate me to do for my partner? What would my partner's love for themselves motivate them to do for themselves? And what would my partner's love for me motivate them to do for me? So they are the questions about what love would do. And each person would need to ask those same group of questions if we're going to fix some things up in the relationship. By the way, the relationship to be fully repaired doesn't need each person to ask those questions. Just if one person asks those questions and actually repairs within themselves the emotional reasons why they can't answer yes to those questions, why they can't understand what their love would want to do for the other person or themselves and vice versa, just the act of one person doing it changes their law of attraction. So it's highly likely the other person is going to notice that this person is being more loving either to themselves and what would that feel like for the other person? Oh, you're not doing as much for me anymore. You know, that's what it would feel like for the other person and they'd be challenged by that automatically. 
Or they might actually be like doing more for the other person, that they realise they had some shut down anger or resentment or whatever and they've released that and now they're doing more for the other person. What will the other person feel about that? Wow, like, gee, I'm getting treated a lot more differently than I was before. And they would feel something about that. Can you see that just one person changing in the relationship will definitely affect the entire relationship without you having to even make the other person change? And in fact, let's go even further than that. If you project any desire on the other person changing, you are automatically out of harmony with love. So, that means I've got to bring everything back to myself. Just be truthful and honest inside of myself. So let's talk about that a bit. If the answer to any of the four questions each partner asks is negative, in the sense that the answer in our personal life is either no, my love for myself would not allow this, or my love for my partner would not allow this, or my partner's love for me would not allow this, or my partner's love for themselves would not allow this, then there are problems within the relationship. And if one or both partners in a relationship are willing to resolve them, it will result in the decay of the relationship. Can you see how that will happen? It's quite easy, isn't it? If one partner is unwilling to ask their personal set of four questions of themselves, there is a high likelihood that the decay in the relationship will occur. So this is where it gets to, are we both committed to personal change? That's a basic question, isn't it, that needs to be asked. So often, many are willing to ask the questions that relate to the other person. It's like me saying, oh, yeah, Mary, what are you doing to love me? Yeah, Mary, what are you doing to, you know? But never asking myself what's going on about my love, you see? Most of us have a tendency to do that at times, just to reflect on what the other person should be doing for us. When both partners are willing to answer all questions, then it becomes apparent that the relationship may continue. And notice I use the word may, but that will depend upon the truthful answers to the questions of what does love do? And the required actions taken by the both parties in terms of being loving towards each other. So it's great when you have a really good conversation with your partner and have a conversation about love and expressing love and all those things. It's not so good when the next day they do exactly the opposite of what they said they would do the previous day, is it? And then, it's not, then the next day they don't deal with the underlying causal emotional reason why, they, why they're doing that. And you know in your heart this is just going to keep going on, keep going on, keep going on, keep going on, keep going on. Gee whiz, like after, after a few weeks of this or a month of this or 10 years of this, what are you starting to feel now? Totally detuned from your partner, totally without a connection with your partner. Which, by the way, could be re-established if both deal with their emotions. So let's look at some of these issues. What does love do? Those four questions. They are all the questions that we really need to ask about what love does. This is a different set of questions about what desire does. But this is the set of questions about what love does. Now the reason why I've separated desire from love is that quite often we think we love somebody but then we tell ourselves that we don't desire them for other reasons. But love and desire are very, very intricately interwoven with each other. So if we don't have desire but we think we love, then there's something inside of us emotionally that's blocking our desire. And we need to look at those things. So that's why we're dealing with those questions separately. But let's look at love of myself. In the letter I've said, in any relationship we need to firstly ask what would love of myself do? Although many people would think this to be a selfish perspective, we need to think clearly and carefully about the following truth. If I sacrifice or betray myself in order to love another, I am not being loving to myself, to the other, or to myself. Betrayal or sacrifice of myself in order to not sacrifice or betray another is the highest form of betrayal. So in other words, in the relationship to love someone else, if to love someone else we must betray ourselves, we are really lying to both ourselves and our partner about the true nature of our own feelings. Can you see that? 
Because the true nature of our own feelings is, I don't want to do this. I don't feel like doing this. And yet, when I do it, I'm sacrificing myself, right? But I'm really lying. I'm lying because I'm not telling my partner my true feelings about the issue and I'm acting in total disharmony with the feelings that I really feel within myself. When we refuse to act upon the true feelings that we have inside of our soul and we refuse to speak the true feelings we have inside of our soul, we are really lying. Isn't that interesting? Can we just... Uh, Pass the microphone. Is that not projecting, though? When you say not projecting, tell me uh, what you uh, what uh, you mean by the question. When you when you're telling the other person how you're really feeling about them or the situation, is that not projecting at them? Not if you're owning your emotions about it. No, the time when you're projecting is when you want them to fix what you're feeling. Now you're projecting. So I can say to Mary, I don't feel loved in this situation. That's not a projection if I'm feeling the feeling of being unloved. But if I'm feeling, you need to fix me not feeling loved in this situation, now it's a projection. Can you see the difference? One is wanting her to do something to fix this situation. The other thing is just feeling my emotion and working through what I'm responsible for. So you can certainly project at the other person if you wish, by saying that they should fix what you're feeling. But they don't have a responsibility to fix what you're feeling at all. Only you have a responsibility for that. So, your partner, not that I have one, but <laughs> your partner is um, doing something that is really bugging you. Is it, do I then say to them, look, this is really bugging me, or do I just go into my own feelings about it? Do I share what I'm feeling or not? Well, you, you have some choices. You can say to them, you know, what you did then really, really made me angry or really made me annoyed. And what I'm trying to do is work out why I'm so annoyed. And, and you can discuss with them why you feel so annoyed inside of yourself. There will always be a childhood causal emotion inside of yourself as to why you're annoyed. Does that make sense? Because when you deal with the emotion, you won't feel annoyed. You'll either act in love or not act in love, or not act. Does that make sense? And both actions, by the way, will be in love. But you will only do it because of love, not because of annoyance. So if I'm annoyed, then there's an emotion inside of me that needs to be dealt with. So I need to, to uh, be truthful with your partner. I just felt a feeling of anger towards you. Hmm. I wonder what that was about. And if you love your partner, you might ask for their assistance to help you. But they don't have to help you. So you can't say, so you can, you can ask them, can you please help me to see what that would be about? Can we talk about that? You could ask them that. And they might say, no, no, I want to go out and work in the garden. If you then produced anger at them, now you're in projection. You're actually wanting them to do something, to fix something inside of yourself. But your partner, they might actually sit down with you and want to discuss the matter. Okay, you're angry with me. What was that about? What did you feel? When was it? What happened? Um, Mary often says now she sweats the small stuff because it, it sort of links you down to all sorts of stuff inside. So, so if I've done something to annoy Mary, she tells me what's, what it's about and then we discuss that, you know, and work the way through, down through the emotions and eventually we get down to usually fears or or hurt from childhood or one of those things. Usually we get right down into that and usually because Mary's now in the mode where she can feel the emotion of it while we're discussing it, usually she'll then go off and cry or if it's me, I'll do the same thing. The key is when you're projecting, you are wanting the other person to fix your problem. Your problem is emotional. They cannot fix it. It's impossible for another person to fix your emotions. Your emotions need to be expressed and experienced. That's the only way you can actually release your emotions. That, that's answered my question because I wasn't sure by ex telling the other person what I was feeling whether I was actually uh, projecting to them, but you've just answered that. Yeah. So again, it gets back down to your motive. If your motive is to get them to fix what you're feeling, yes, you are projecting. So even your motive might be, can I have a hug, please? 
why you want because you want to fix this feeling that you're you know unlovable and a hug does nicely right that is a projection that is a demand upon them to fix an emotion inside of you that needs to be deeper and deep more deeply dealt with inside of yourself you follow me once you've done that you might feel really like have a big cry or whatever and they may desire to give you a hug that's fine that's not because you wanted them to it's because they felt to that's a totally different emotion. Can you see the difference? Let's see if we can hand the mic over to Karen. Can you do the same thing with your adult children or does the fact that they're your children complicate it so that no, you can do the same thing with your adult children, certainly. You can say to them, you know, I felt angry towards you because da, 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 and away you go. But as soon as you expect them to fix it, you are now projecting. It's the same principles with any person, really. You can always discuss how you feel with another person, but look sincerely at your motive for doing so. If your motive is that they change their action, then you are not harmonious with love, if that's your motive. But that question of whether what they're doing is because of something you're not feeling, that doesn't cloud the water at all? But that's, it's the same principle though. Like, for example, in any interaction that I have, if I have an interaction with you, there's a law of attraction going on. So, and if you're angry with me, then that law of attraction for me is maybe some fear about a woman being angry with me. And I can say, you're really angry with me, and I need to feel this fear that I'm feeling about you being angry with me. That's my responsibility. Your responsibility is your anger. But once I feel my fear, there's a higher likelihood that you won't even be angry with me. You'll go and be angry with someone else if you've still got that emotion in you. right? And even if you get angry with me, if I've got no fear, it'll be like any other conversation that we might have. Just that you were angry and I wasn't. And I didn't feel anything from it. Does that make sense? So no matter what happens, these principles apply right the way across the board, really, with our children, with our parents, and all other people in all relationships. But here we're specifically looking at the love relationship with a partner. Yeah. All right, so I'll go back to that point, though, that when we are misrepresenting our own emotional truth, even if that truth is an error, we are actually lying to ourselves and the other person. So, I am angry. Am I in error from God's perspective? Yes. Because when I'm at one with God, will I ever be angry? No. So, if I'm angry, then I'm in denial of something inside of myself, am I not? So, if I'm angry, I am in error. Yes. Am I allowed to feel my anger? Yes. In fact, I must feel my anger. I'm allowed to feel my anger, and I must feel my anger. And when I feel my anger, I will probably get down to the deeper emotions. Right? So I feel the deeper emotions. But if I actually say to my partner, she says, oh, are you angry? Um, no. <laughs> what have I just done? Lied. Right? I haven't disclosed the truth of my feelings. Now, most of us are very sensitive to our partner's feelings, aren't we? We know when something's wrong, hey? Most of the time. Hmm, something's wrong. And then we go into this place, usually, I think I'll ignore it. Because <laughs> it will go away then. <laughs> Trust me, nothing ignored ever goes away. And there are very deep feelings inside of us that we need to feel if we want to ignore any feeling that we're getting from our partner. All right. Or any feeling, of course, that we feel within ourselves. So, allow yourself to feel deeply about telling the emotional truth that you feel to your partner. It does not mean your relationship has to break up. It's just the emotion that you're feeling right now. And most of the time, if it's been triggered, it will be an emotion that's still inside of you from your own childhood. So if it happens to be me and I'm a male and I have a feeling towards Mary who's a female, there's a high likelihood that somewhere in my past I've had exactly this feeling towards a female in the past that's been suppressed. 
usually through my environment. I might have had a teacher when I was five years old that, that she just reminded me of, of a suppressed emotion inside of me. Or it might be my mother that she's reminded me of a certain situation that occurred. Does that make sense to everyone? And I need to go into that underlying causal emotion. If I do not say the emotional truth, then I don't have an opportunity to get anywhere deeply into that reality of what's going on inside of me that's stored. And all I'm doing is just skipping over, skipping over, skipping over my soul. Is that loving my soul? No. Is it my loving the other person in the relationship? No, because they're getting a fictitious representation of my truth. And so it's not loving to them either. So, since living in the soul requires that we act upon our own feelings, if we refuse to do so in order to please another person, then the resulting action is really based on a misrepresentation of our internal truth and can only result in future pain or suffering for both persons in the relationship. So, every time I misrepresent the truth to my partner, I'm angry. She asks me whether I'm angry. I say, no. I've just misrepresented the truth to my partner. That is actually more damaging to the relationship than if I owned up to my anger and said, yes, I am angry. Because the yes, I am angry lets me go deeper, doesn't it? It lets me say, why am I angry? So she could then say, why, am I, why are you angry? Oh, well, that particular thing that you did, you know, it really brought up some stuff for me. What did it bring up? You know, and we can go deeper and deeper until we get, connect with the causal emotion. And once I connect with the causal emotion, I might go in my room and cry for a bit or whatever and connect with the underlying reason that this whole law of attraction event occurred in the first place. See, in a relationship, there are two people that would love you completely. You would love you completely and your partner would love you completely. If you love yourself, you will not be able to take an action that results in the betrayal of your deepest emotions. So we won't be able to take an action that betrays our own emotional truth, even if our emotional truth is in error from God's perspective. We would still not be able to take that action. So in other words, I could be sitting there, I'm angry, from God's perspective, that's wrong. Shouldn't be angry. I'm angry. No, I'm not angry. No, I'm not angry. No, I'm not angry. <sighs> Just calm down. <laughs> ah, isn't it wonderful breathing? Breathing can get you over a lot of anger and uh, out of a lot of emotions if you use it that way. It can also help you get into them, depending on what your desire is. It always gets back down to your intention. So I can breathe and breathe and breathe and breathe, get myself out of an emotion that I really feel. My partner says, were you angry then? No, I'm all right now. Uh, do you want to talk about it? No. And what are we just doing? We're avoiding, we're betraying our own emotional truth. We just loved ourselves less. Because what, what is your soul? Your soul is your emotions, your passions, your desires, your longings. If you betray that, you are loving yourself less. If you love yourself less, you are going to experience more pain. Guaranteed. You can always guarantee more pain comes from loving yourself less. This might just be behind you. You know, so the emotional honesty is like, you know, it's really like falling on the sword and owning, uh, you know, owning all your stuff. And yep. you know, I'm not, I'm not very good at that. You know? So, I'm you know, thinking like, you know, so what can we do? Because that's really the core of, of what of how to progress, isn't it, to get to that point? Yes. So if you're not very good at it, it was like, you know, you can actually like, you know, pray more for humility to be able to, you know, because some people say, look, I did, you know, I, I just keep blocking it. And where, you know, where do I go now? Yes. You know, so it's always, you know, maybe you can pray about that to, to be able to open yourself up and, you know, because a lot of the time it's pretty ugly what you want to say. Exactly. <laughs> so, exactly. Know, and to own that is pretty brave. <laughs> exactly. In, in, so. so what we'll do the next session is talk about how our relationship with God can infiltrate into all of these processes. And what we want to do today is just see how the relationship with each other is actually working. 
But you're dead right. The relationship with God can actually help you so much in this process because it helps you be totally humble and you can even pray for assistance. So let's say I just my, my partner asks me, are you angry with me? And I say, oh, no. And then I go away and I'm working away in a garden and I just realise, you know, the truth was I was angry with her. Gee, all right. And so I start praying to God about, okay, you know, what inside of me causes me to keep misrepresenting my own emotional truth to my own partner. So I can pray about that and long for God to answer that. Then if I'm praying in, and I'm working in harmony with the prayer, which is something we'll discuss next time too, is I would actually then have to get up from what I was doing and walk back inside and say, you know when you asked me whether I was angry with you? Yeah. Well, actually I was angry with you. You were right. <laughs> and is it right if we can talk about it? You know, that process can occur then, can't it? once I'm facing those things. If your partner truly loved you completely, they would not allow or ask you to do something that seems to be a betrayal of yourself. For example, if your partner loves you, they would not ask you to lie for them or anyone else, since to lie, for you to lie would be a betrayal of yourself. Does that make sense? So if your partner is actually expecting, or you are actually expecting of your partner, that they don't tell you, which often happens, by the way, in a relationship, where we actually want our partner to not tell us what they are feeling, then they are actually expecting us to betray ourselves. And if we have that feeling, that we do not want to know what our partner is thinking or feeling, then we are betraying ourselves and our partner through that act. You see, in a true partnership, both people would want to know what each other is feeling, wouldn't they? Of course they would. And in fact, they'd want to be totally conscious of that as well. All right. Now let's look at the section, love of my partner. In any relationship, the next question we need to ask is what would the love of my partner do? The same statement applies if I sacrifice my partner, by the way, if my partner sacrifices or portrays herself, in my case, in order to love me, then she, then she is not being loving to me or to herself. And betrayal or sacrifice of my partner in order to not sacrifice or betray me is in fact the highest form of betrayal that she could do. So when I understand that, I start thinking. I go, every time I want my partner to betray her own emotional truth, I am actually asking her to love herself less. And I am actually loving her less too. Can you see that? Now let's look at this. Or putting this into our partner's perspective, it would read, if my partner has to betray his or herself in order to not betray me, then that is their highest form of betrayal. If to love me, my partner must betray himself or herself, then my partner is really lying to both themselves and to me about the true nature of their own feelings. And he or she is refusing to act upon or to be honest about the feelings they have. And the same thing applies, since living in the soul requires a person acts on their feelings. If they refuse to do so to please me, then the resulting action is only going to create future pain and suffering for both of us. Can you see how important the emotional truth is, even if it's in error from God's perspective? It is so important. And what myself and Mary try to do in this kind of relationship is, we try to own up to all of the emotions inside of ourselves that we're feeling towards each other at any one point in time. Then what we do is we ask ourselves, if I was at one with God, would I be feeling this towards the other person? And if the answer is no, which most of the time it is, then we would go into the underlying emotional reasons as to why we're feeling what we're feeling. Now, for Mary and myself, Every single emotion we've found in that relationship has always had a first century causal emotion associated with it. An event in the first century that happened in our lives between us generally that's affecting our relationship. In your case it will be to do with your parents shutting you down in some area in your childhood. 
it'll be an emotion related to your father or to your mother that will be interfering in the relationship. And I sometimes say these words, it's not a very pretty, pretty picture though, that really when you're in bed, you're not just in bed with you and your partner. If you're carrying all these emotional injuries and hurts, you're in bed with your partner's mother, your partner's father, your raw father, your mother. Now it's a terrible picture, isn't it? I know that, right? <laughs> But really that's what's happening. That's really what's happening. Okay? So every time I hold on to an emotion and, don't, and deny this emotional truth, I'm really inviting one of those people into my partnership. Which is obviously going to damage the partnership. Now we might not be inviting them physically, although many parents, many married couples do that as well, don't they? Uh, you just, uh, you just had an argument with me, I'm going to go and talk to mum about that. And off they go and talk to mum about that. The, it is the most pointless thing you could do. Where did your emotional injuries come from? <laughs> your mother or your father. Why go and talk to them about that? Right? Honestly, if, if you can't own your own emotions inside of the relationship, talking to another person outside of the relationship where your emotional injuries came from is only going to make matters worse. Can you see why? Because all of your emotional injuries came from that location, or the majority of them. So, it's fine to go and talk to your mother and father if that's what you want to do, but you are just inviting somebody into your relationship who you hope will agree with you. And of course, the majority of the times, unless they've worked through a lot of their own emotions, they will agree with you. And isn't that wonderful? You just got some confirmation of your own emotional injury from the person who created it. Yeah. <laughs> I know that's blunt, but it's true. So in a relationship, there are two people that my partner would love completely, his or herself and myself. If he or she loves himself or herself, he or she will not be able to take an action that results in the betrayal of his or her feelings. Can you see what's going on? It's quite simple questions, isn't it? But when you start looking at relationships in this way, it starts exposing a lot of interplay between the two parties. Now, obviously, the relationship is a work in progress. So, you know, you can't enter a relationship and then all of a sudden go, oh, okay, uh, you're now perfect, I'm now perfect, everything's wonderful, we're going to get along great. And then tomorrow when the first thing happens that, oh, it didn't cook a meal for me, that wasn't very perfect, or didn't cook a very good meal for me, that wasn't perfect either, then we start having arguments because we expect everything to be perfect. Obviously that's not going to work, is it? We're at work in progress right up until we hit the one condition with God, right? And even then we're still really a work in progress because while we don't have any emotional injuries that would harm a relationship, we're still learning new truths and growing in truth. So we're always going to be a work in progress, if that's the case, isn't it? Every single, the rest of your life is always going to be a work in progress. But the emotional injuries won't dictate what's going on in your relationship as much. Now since we can't expect the relationship to be perfect, each person inside of themselves must be completely resolved to deal with all of their outstanding painful emotions and feelings. And if you can't do that, because that's a pretty rare circumstance to get both people in the partnership as committed as each other into dealing with their emotional feelings. Now what I really love about myself and Mary's relationship now is we are both as committed as each other into dealing with our emotional feelings. And it's just a wonderful thing. Because it means that we can both work through everything with confidence with each other. And it's just a beautiful thing. If you can experience that, it's really lovely. And this has been the first time in my life since the first century. Um, obviously, through the spirit world, we were like this too. But on earth, this has been the first time in my life that I've actually re-experienced that experience of being able to be completely open and honest emotionally with each other. And it's really a beautiful gift you can give each other. The question needs to be asked, though, do both parties in the relationship have the same level of desire for personal development and the resolution of internal painful emotions? And do they both understand that this path of personal development has the potential in the future to result in the separation 
of the partnership. Many of you have some deep fears about progressing spiritually because you are worried that one or both of you will change so much you won't want to be together anymore. And it is uh, something that needs to be dealt with as an emotion, a fear that we may have. Because there is a chance you may not be together anymore. Well, you think about it. If I keep growing in love, keep growing in desire, keep growing in love, keep growing in desire, I'm growing towards God, who else am I growing towards? My soulmate, who's the other half of me. Eventually that soulmate, if it's not my partner, is going to be somehow in my life. What am I going to do when that happens? If I'm in a relationship with someone else? I'll have to start making some pretty straight decisions with myself, won't I? Because there will be some unique things going on between me and this soulmate of mine that it's not happening with this partner. And I'll need to work my way through that issue. In the first century, I was asked by a group of Pharisees uh, a question which was, you know, a lot of times the Pharisees like to try and, you know, present a scenario in order to uh, trip me up in terms of giving an answer. Anyway, what happened in this case was they asked me, they said that uh, a woman died, uh, sorry, a man died and he was married. And the widow, who was very, very young, um, married again. And in, in those times, uh, in those Jew, Jewish times 2,000 years ago, there was a thing called brother-in-law marriage as well, which was if, you're, if, if, a, if a husband died, then if the wife had children by that husband, she would often be married to the brother, in, the, her, the brother of the husband. Right? Now, a lot of you girls nowadays wouldn't like that very much, right? <laughs> but unfortunately, and I say unfortunately because it was quite distressing for many of those women, um, that often used to occur. But anyway, the Pharisees would say, oh, all right, let's say the second man she was married to died. And then the third man she was married to died. And the fourth man she was married to died. And that happened seven times. This was the question, right? So she had seven husbands, all of which died. Terrible law of attraction. But, <laughs> so something might have been going on. She might have even been poisoning them, I don't know. But anyway, they, they presented it as if, as if... They said, which one would she marry in the heavens? And I said, none of them. Because in the heavens... They will be like angels in the heavens, and the angels in the heavens have their soulmate. And the soulmate may be none of those persons. Right. So the truth is that you may be right now in a relationship with somebody, and, you know, unfortunately that person isn't your soulmate. And when I say unfortunately, I, I don't know if it's that unfortunate, because they're obviously in a relationship right now for good reasons. Your law of attraction is there drawing this person into, into your life. So it's very fortunate this person's in your life. Without this person in your life, you won't probably work through some of the emotions you need to work through. So it's a very fortunate thing this person who's not your soulmate is in your life. But you'll get to a time in your own progression where you start having longings for your soulmate. And your partner will start having longings for their soulmate once they're on a divine path too. And it might just so happen that you start working out that you're actually not soulmates and that you would like to separate in order to find your soulmates. So that might be a, something that happens. Are you prepared for that? If you're not, then there's just an emotion you need to work your way through, you know, like everything else, right? And it might be some big emotions. Some people, when they work through these emotions, often work through weeks and weeks and weeks of crying with these emotions. Right? Because there's a lot of soulmate-based opening that needs to happen at the soul before we can reach the at one condition with our soulmate, which is the 22nd sphere state. Anyway, if both parties do have this strong desire, then they're willing to understand their partner will make mistakes just as they do along the path. And each understands there is the potentiality that sometime in the future the true nature of one or both persons may be exposed by the process and that the true nature may dictate that their partner or themselves needs to move away from the partnership in order to progress. Now that even happens with soulmates, believe it or not. I have seen many soulmates get together on earth 
work through a whole group of emotions that make them feel quite happy with each other and quite content with each other and then because they have now compatible emotional injuries not make a single shred of progression from that time until they pass. Now obviously if the two of you were soulmates together in that situation the wisest thing to do would be to move apart from each other for a time and work through those injuries because otherwise you're both going to stay in a very stagnant place. So even if the person that you're with is your soulmate there is a potentiality that asking these questions may result in you moving away from them for a period of time so that you can work through the emotions that are being triggered. Of course it's much more advisable for a person to only enter into a relationship when they have dealt completely with all of their outstanding painful emotions. Now if that was the case, the continuation of the human race would, <laughs> would be severely in jeopardy. Right? This can be done by developing a complete relationship with God since God has no injuries in love and so therefore we'd be forced into dealing with all of our personal love injuries when we develop our relationship with God. It doesn't have to take a long time as some seem to think. As we, since as we progress into it one with our Father, his love flows into us in greater quantities and exposes all the issues we have internally inside of ourselves to deal with. But trust me, even if you do that, what will happen so I did that. I separated from, I didn't have any relationships. As soon as I got on the divine path, felt my soulmate. It's not my person, not my soulmate. No relationship. Five years. So I spent five years alone on that path. But you see, what happens is you deal with this emotion, you deal with that emotion, you deal with this emotion, and all, all of a sudden you're starting to deal with some soulmate emotions. What I mean by soulmate emotions is inside of each one of us there's a group of emotions that prevent our soulmate from coming to us. Does that make sense? And so I start dealing with that emotion. I start dealing with this emotion. And what's going to happen when I start dealing with that emotion? All of a sudden my soulmate's going to be drawn to come to me. So sooner or later I'm going to catch up with my soulmate. And most probably I'll catch up with them before I've reached a condition of one with God. Does that make sense to everyone? So sooner or later I'm probably going to be in a relationship where I still have emotional injuries even if that relationship is with my soulmate. And in fact if that relationship is with my soulmate she or he is going to trigger my emotional injuries even more than the person that I've ever been with before. And it's going to confront even more emotional injuries within me. And that's exactly what's happened for me. Like, I have had more and more emotional injuries confronted by Mary than I have from anyone else. Which has been great through those injuries as well. So as you progress on the divine love path you will automatically draw your soulmate into your sphere of operation if your soulmate is still on earth. And if your soulmate's in the spirit world they are probably already with you anyway. Uh, most people in the spirit world soon feel the draw of their soulmate. Now if we have an openness and willingness to deal with these issues we can within a relatively short time come into the condition where we have resolved painful emotional injuries that would damage a relationship. Now it's not the emotional injuries inside of yourself that really damage the relationship. Because you can have emotional injuries inside of yourself and actually have a relationship grow as long as both of you are willing to deal with those emotional injuries. The only emotional injuries that could damage the relationship are the emotional injuries revol revolving around my own unwillingness to deal with my own emotions. And they are very important that I deal with those and if I can deal with those before I enter a relationship I'm going to have a very, very powerful relationship. Now unfortunately many of us don't deal with those before we enter the relationship and we are still in a lot of deep resistance to our own emotional injuries. So we enter the relationship, what's the first things that start getting triggered after the sex uh, dies away for a week or two is those emotional injuries. And so what we need to do firstly, and this is something for all of us to ponder, deal with the emotional injuries you have to your resistance of your own emotions. Right? 
and the anger feelings, annoyance feelings and those kind of feelings are all capping and telling you that you're resisting your own emotions. So if you feel those feelings at all, no, you're resisting your own emotions. The less you're angry and the less you're annoyed, I don't mean manufacturing a state of pleasantry. I mean inside of yourself you can feel that you're not angry and annoyed very much anymore in your life. And you'll get to a point, in fact, perhaps where you're even not angry and annoyed at all, it seems. That's the time when there might be still emotional injuries within you, but you are now open to dealing with them in the most possible loving manner that you are able to do. So that's a good space to be. So there's some practical situations, so let's mention some. Let's say that we love our partner, but our partner is an alcoholic and continuously drinks too much and the result is there's chaos in my life and their life. You know, we have a lot of uh, monetary problems, we have a lot of difficulties with our relationship, maybe our sex life also has difficulty because of it. And so, you know, there are a lot of issues that they may raise. We need to ask ourselves, what would love do? If I loved myself truly, would I allow the other person to continue to interrupt and damage my life experience by drinking too much? If they loved me, would they continually desire to damage my life experience? If I loved them, would I allow them to continue to damage themselves without attempting to resolve the issue? If they loved themselves, would they ever drink too much? You can see in every case there's a no answer to those questions, right? And if that's the case, the four issues become very clear. The first is that our partner cannot love themselves and drink too much. Secondly is that we can't love ourselves and allow our lives to be interrupted from the drinking. Third is that we are not loving our partner if we allow them to do something that destroys myself without taking any action. And the fourth issue, that our partner does not love us or they are unwilling to deal with the personal issue that causes our distress. Now, can you see just those four questions, bang, 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 when it comes to an action result, doesn't it? I have to do something. And this is where we have the most trouble. You see, most of us don't want to do something because of other emotional reasons. The emotional reason might be, if I'm a woman with this man, it might be a feeling of security that I get from a man. And maybe, just maybe, if I leave this man, I won't ever have another man in my life, is the feeling I might have. And how insecure am I going to feel then if my security is based around a man? Can you see? That would be triggered straight away. So I might be going, mm, no. I might have children. I might have three children. And I start feeling guilt feelings about you know, taking children away from their father because I was taken away from my father when I was little and it really affected me badly. And then I go, hmm, I'm starting now to worry, right? I'm starting now to feel, hmm, I don't know if I want to act. And we'll often stay in these kind of situations that we don't want to act upon for many years. And each time our sadness grows, our pain grows, the other person's pain grows and the situation just gets worse. And it's only when the pain is greater than our fear that we finish up doing something. I'm suggesting to you to not wait until then. Don't wait until the pain is greater than the fear. Lesser, make your fear less. The way you do that is to feel your emotions about your fear and release them. If you're afraid of security, cry about the feelings of insecurity you have inside of yourself. Deal with that emotionally. When you deal with that emotionally, you will be able to leave this relationship, even if it's temporarily, in order to demonstrate love of yourself. So if that relationship, as I've defined it, was present, the most loving course of action would be to leave that relationship. Now, it doesn't need to be permanently. You just need to leave that relationship and deal with the underlying emotional issues inside of yourself as to why you attracted it. And there'll be feelings maybe of lack of self-worth or feelings of that he was like my father and I haven't dealt with a heap of things about love of my father. Does that make sense? That I need to work my way through. Now, I could work my way through them in the relationship, but... Every single day, this man is going to be treating me unlovingly. 
which is just going to be adding to my pain. If I loved myself, would I do that? Probably not. So I would leave the relationship, deal with the underlying father-based issues that obviously are being triggered, and also the underlying self-worth issues that are obviously being triggered within myself. And once I dealt with both of those things, what would I do? I might go back into the relationship if the man has also made changes. Might not. So I might work after, through all of that and then feel like, no, I really love that man, you know. I really love this person. And I'm just going to wait for him to work through his stuff. And, uh, but then if he doesn't work through his stuff, would I get angry if I really loved him? No, I wouldn't. I would patiently allow him to work through his stuff. In the spirit world, there's this spirit who is the, the soulmate of a man who lived on earth that you would have heard of historically called Nero. You've heard of Emperor Nero? He was a Roman emperor, one of the early Roman emperors around the time that we, just after the time I lived on earth. He lived for nearly a thousand years in the hills while his soulmate waited for him. So it's possible to wait for a person that long and be happy the entire time, which is what his soulmate was. So you can do that on earth too. There's nothing stopping you from doing that and still loving yourself. If you're unhappy doing it, then obviously it's not a loving act anymore. And this, la this lady in the heavens, she was happy doing that. And she didn't have a relationship with anyone else in the spirit world until the man she knew her soulmate was got to the condition where she could help him. And there's a lovely passage in the uh, Paget Messages if you want to read about that, that relationship. So you can wait for people. It's not an unloving thing to wait for somebody. It is an unloving thing to wait for somebody in an unhappy state. I mean, if you're in an unhappy state waiting for someone. Right? It's not an unloving thing to wait for another person when you're in a happy state and they're in an unhappy state. <laughs> That's okay. But it would be very loving if you are unhappy doing it to yourself. Now, if the other person is willing to resolve their issues, then we may have to move away from the relationship for a period of time. If after the period of time allowed, the partners do not resolve their issues, then we would need some time to decide whether a separation from the relationship needs to be permanent. Or, like I said, whether you want to wait. If we find it difficult to remove ourselves from our partnership, when our partner refuses to change, then we have a lot of work to do about the issue of self-love. Lots of work to do about the issue of self-love. So any person that you see in an abusive environment where their partner is abusing them in any way, verbally, emotionally, physically, sexually, that person who's being abused has some very, very deep issues of unworthiness and other emotional issues to work through that you can assist them to work through. And when they work through those things, they will definitely not allow abuse anymore in their life. Now, it's interesting. I had a chat with a, a lady overseas when I was last overseas, and it was really interesting because she described her life to me. And she said the first man she was with he abused her violently, physically abused her. So eventually, after eight years of living in that relationship, she got out of that relationship. Right? The next relationship she got into, the man abused her emotionally. But he didn't abuse her physically. So what did she work through? She'd worked through the emotional issues about worthiness with regard to abuse, physical abuse and pain. But she hadn't worked through the emotions that she had of tolerating emotional abuse and pain. Can you see that? It took her another six or seven years to work through that and then she left that man. And then she found a man who she could actually manipulate and control. <laughs> and that's who she's with today. So there's a whole group of new emotions she needs to work her way through and that is, by, uh, is to allow herself to work through. Can you see why she would marry such a man? Of course, you've had, if you've had 16 years of, 8 years of violent abuse 
and then another eight years or so of, of abuse with regard to emotional abuse. Wouldn't you want that to stop? Yes. But she still wanted a relationship and so she chose a man then who met the criteria of not, who would not abuse her. Now that's not what I'm suggesting to do either. What I'm suggesting inside of yourself is to resolve in each case the emotions you feel. So she resolved the emotions in the first case, but it took quite some time. Resolved the emotions in the second case. And this is how most of our lives pan out, isn't it? You look back on your own life, this is what happened many times through your own life, like where we resolve something out of that situation, resolve another thing. But we take years to do it, don't we? It's so frustrating. We think, oh, gee, it took so long just to get me out of that. Look, it's, I spent so long of my life dealing with things that now I can deal with like in a week just by opening up emotionally and really feeling the causal emotion. Bang, the whole thing's gone. Back then it was like years and years of slog, you know, just working through one emotion. So many of us have that in our lives. Now if we're on the natural love path, that will be the case. That's, that will be how our relationships grow. And this is why these questions are so important to ask ourselves. So the question, what does love do? is such an important question to ask ourselves even if we're on the natural love path. Even if we're not involving God in any of our processing, in any of our life, we don't agree with AJ when it comes to God. You know, God's never helped me give God the boot. And we get back to this stage, right, where we, where we feel self-reliant. Yeah, that's the only way forward, so I'm going to be self-reliant. If, you, if you're in that state, keep asking yourself what would love to because it will reduce your pain. It's going to reduce the pain in your relationships. If we go Kerry and then Jeanette, or Jeanette for sorry, that microphone to carry in. Uh, it needs to turn on, so just whack it on. We turn it off because it re reverbs. AJ, the lady you were just speaking of abroad, she was not at that time on the divine love path. No. But you she said still isn't. she resolved. Yep. Right, but she would have only done effectual stuff, not causal. No, no, she dealt with some causal emotion. Yeah, because just naturally, but she it, just, just did naturally, it naturally, yeah. Um, just by living in a situation with a violent man, she actually dealt with a causal emotion that was inside of herself, where her worth would allow herself to be physically abused. She released enough of that emotion to now attract a different man. So she did deal with some of the emotion without God. Without God. Without God. Thank you very much. Yeah. And you can do that same thing without God. You can work your way through lots of emotions without God in a very similar manner. AJ, I don't, since I met you, I realised I really don't know very much about love at all. So this might sound really basic, but it's really hard for me to ask what does love do and answer it clearly because honestly, so many times I don't know. Yep, very good. That's why in the end, the second question we'll be asking in the second session is what does God's love do? Right, And that is a very easy question to answer in most cases. A lot easier than most people realise because God is treating you lovingly right at this moment. In fact, God is treating you lovingly right at every single moment of your life. Yeah. So that's a very interesting statement if you start thinking about that. You'll see what God's love does and we'll talk about that in that next session. What does God's love do? But sometimes an easier way, Kerry, for us to deal with it is to ask ourselves this question, am I in pain? If you're in pain, then whatever is creating the pain is not loving. Now remember, everything that's creating pain is usually an emotion within myself. It begins from an emotion within myself. So there's something inside of myself creating this pain. Any pain I am experiencing is not loving. Love doesn't create pain. So if I'm in a painful feeling, then it's not because of love. It's some error. And that can often help me a lot in determining what love would do. Because love never creates pain. Love always, in fact, soothes pain. Love is like a balm, if you like, on a wound. 
it always makes it better. Um, if we're in pain, then that's a good indication that we don't understand what love is doing. And what I do in that place is always ask God, like, I don't understand what's going on here, but I'm in pain, so I know something's wrong inside of me that's unloving towards myself or towards someone else. And so what I do is ask God to show me through my law of attraction what that would be. And when you do that, you'll find you'll get answers. If you really want to know the answers, you get the answers quite rapidly. Yeah. It's a good question. If we go here first and then up to Carol next. Um, I don't know if you've mentioned anything about the effects of um, biological urges or instinct. So <laughs> yep. when you enter a relationship and all those hormones are flowing mm -hmm. and the bonding chemicals, yep. um, that seems to override any sort of... Override reason. Any sort of um, spiritual... <laughs> Development or love or anything yeah, else. Yeah, it's, it's so strong, that urge. Is that, again, an underlying emotional... I'm going to be talking about that at the, after the break. Okay. So we'll talk about the sexual side of the relationship and what creates it. Yep. Right. Yep. Right. The reason why, um, just as a brief uh, summary, though, the reason why we often are led sexually into a relationship through this, you know, through this need, this sort of really powerful, lustful type feelings and so forth, is because, um, start where I use another, here's me, here's the woman who is now the object of my desire. Uh, yep. Now, if I have emotional injuries inside of my soul, so remember my half of the soul is connected to, to my body here. We'll skip the spirit body for the moment. We're just the two, that's the two halves. This is my soul, which contains all of my emotions. Agreed? Here's my physical body, which has the whole system of my physical body is dependent upon my soul for survival. Every single hormone that I've got flowing through me is a complete mirror of emotions within my soul. You follow that? Okay. So let's say I have an emotion within my soul that is there inside of me. A big unworthy emotion. Now that will affect my body's first, second chakra generally will be affected greatly by that and my hormones will be affected by that. What the, how they'll be affected is any woman who is going to treat me unworthily <coughs> so let's say this unworthy feeling is with women specifically any woman that's going to treat me unworthily my hormones will kick up a notch because of that emotional injury does that make sense so all of a sudden I feel this real big sexual urge to go with that woman because actually she's satisfying an emotional injury within myself and she might have first, second chakra areas, lots of rage and anger towards men. I'm unworthy and she feels she's ultra worthy when it comes to men. <laughs> she feels she's better than men. I am going to be very attracted to her. Right. And my whole system will just flare up, you know, and all the emotions, all the hormones will flare up as a result of this emotion, this unworthy emotion, getting satisfied from this person. And all of a sudden, energy will flow through me really rapidly.